Now I'm using a uh, precision scientific instrument called a piece of string. So the next thing is setting the angle up and down, which determines the action, the height of the bridge saddle, and a whole bunch of other kind of important things. And meanwhile, while I'm still evaluating the fit of the neck before I commit to gluing it, I've got the bridge saddle cut and shaped and fitted and intentionally made on the high side so I can cut it down after the neck is officially in place. And meanwhile, I also have the bridge pins, which naturally takes two sets. Armed with them, now I can ream out the holes in the bridge to exactly fit them. One of those operations that you just do one at a time. Take your time. And of course, you have a shop rag on the inside of the guitar to catch the shavings so you don't have to go back later and figure out how to vacuum them out. Now ideally, you want them at the point where they fit snugly and just almost, but not quite, bottom out. And you make sure that you have all the shavings out of there before you make that last check. That one is just about exactly right. One down, eleven to go. And after all the debris is cleaned up, another piece of the project that can be declared done and finished. And boy are my fingers tired. Of course the neck wasn't designed for easy installation and removal. In fact, it wasn't intended to ever be removed at all. I just lucked out and the old glue joint was weak enough I could manage to break it loose. Removing it is a total pain in the butt because it's all done from inside. For starters, you go in there with a screwdriver and take out this one big screw and you go back in and get the screwdriver and then you go in with a wrench into a place you can't even feel because you're holding onto the wrench you just have to know it's in there fiddle around and eventually you get the wrench on a big nut. This takes both practice and patience. Not to mention determination. <laughs> Ever so slowly, a little at a time, you get the nut loose enough that you can get it with your fingers and unscrew it. eventually carefully get the nut a couple of washers out go back and get the wrench out and the neck comes off that nut was screwed onto this rather uh, totally over designed truss rod which is actually the main support and strength of the entire neck it's never going to warp But now, we have the neck off, we can add and subtract shims as we need. And uh, I have at this point eventually gotten it to the point where I have a tapered shim. It's finished in other words. It starts thicker up here, it gets thinner down here. So the neck is at 
just the right angle, at least, I think. And I'm about ready to go ahead and glue it on. So there's been another one of those midstream changes in plans. I had a very long talk with a very highly experienced luthier right here in my area who first of all talked me into finishing the body and the neck separately because they're easier to handle that way and you glue them together after it's finished. Okay. Secondly, he has instructed me to put an initial coat on the top which is what you're looking at. For reasons that shall be disclosed later. But you sure can see the subtle character of that Adirondack spruce that didn't show up until I put a finish on it. Mind you, this is strictly a ceiling coat. It's hardly a finish yet. And here we are in my high-tech spray booth with the latest state-of-the-art in overspray protection and an automatic device overhead which on command will turn the paint victim around to my desired location. The neck has been sanded with 400 grit paper which is now the coarsest grit that will touch any of this guitar until it's finished. It's ready for its first coat. And while I'm doing that, I'm taking the camera back in the house. And immediately after that first coat. Note the rather striking change in color. Now at this point the neck has a dozen or so coats on it. I'm not really counting coats. Uh, what matters is that it's just about to the point of being declared finished. If you can see the reflections coming off of it. Now I started uh, doing the final standing on the wood with 400 grit sandpaper. Uh, I also sanded the first coat with 400. Then as it built up I went up to 600 grit, uh, eventually 1000 grit. Now what I'm going to do here is break the glaze with 1500 grit. And if it looks good, I will buff it with 2000 grit and it's finished. If I see any imperfections in it at this point, after the 1500 grit, I'll give it another coat. And I'm doing all of this now as wet sanding. Ever so slowly little bit at a time, and in this case all I'm doing is breaking the glaze and looking for the surface to be absolutely uniform with no little shiny spots on it which would mean that there are low spots still that haven't been filled yet. And I sand a little and I wipe it so that I can see it 
dry. And I see little dimples all over in here where I haven't sanded down to the flat surface yet. And I just keep doing this. Now all the rounded and contoured parts are all done freehand. And as with, as with so much of this, it's all purely by feel. And meanwhile, the body just got back from the shop where it was getting a rosette inlaid into it. I could have spent 400 bucks on tools and spent the time learning how to do it the one and only time I ever will do it. Or I could have just turned it over to somebody who already knew how and does it for a living. And he did a damn gorgeous job of it. It's done. It's over with. Now I can get on with the finishing. Uh, there are two coats on the top. Uh, the first one to seal it before he did the cutting for this. The uh, second one just to seal the top of the rosette inlay itself. Now I can take the tape off of the sides and get on with the finishing of the whole thing. For however many coats it takes until it looks good enough to suit me.